Welcome to Copcast. I'm Rumbi Chakamba, Associate Editor at DevEx, and I'm in Sham El Sheikh in Egypt for this year's United Nations Climate Conference. In this podcast series, we bring you inside the walls of the Blue Zone for a series of in-depth conversations with climate and development leaders, asking them the big questions. What's really needed to make meaningful progress towards climate goals, and what role should the development community play to support that? This year's climate negotiations are taking place as the world is dealing with overlapping crises and conflicts, with food and energy prices soaring and historic levels of rain, drought and heat being recorded across the world, the need to turn climate commitments into action is more crucial than ever. I'm usually based in Habroni, Botswana, where I lead Devitz's coverage of the African continent. With this being the first COP on African soil since 2016, it feels like an opportunity for African voices who have been disproportionately affected by the climate crisis to be heard. The Egypt presidency has dubbed COP27 as the implementation COP, with the hope that the world can finally move from making pledges to implementation and action. In this episode of COPcast, we look back at some of the commitments made last year in Glasgow, take stock of where we currently stand, and highlight some expectations for the African COP. To help kick off the podcast series, I'm joined by my colleagues Sarah Jerving and William Morley, who will also be on the ground with me in Sharm El Sheikh. Will and Sarah, thank you so much for joining me. I always find it so strange when I'm on the opposite side of the mic, so I'm happy that I get to interview you guys this time. Um, I'll start off with you, Will. You were at COP26 last year in Glasgow, and for me and Sarah, this will be our first COP. So can you take us through some of the commitments that were made last year and what we should expect to see this year? Yeah, certainly, Rumbi. Thanks for, for having me on. There was loads of commitments made last year. I'm going to focus, Rumbi, just on the adaptation side, not so much the higher income nation reducing emissions mitigation side of things, um, but of key interest, I think, to, to, DevEx, to a DevEx audience uh, will be the pledge to double adaptation finance um, adaptation finance is helping countries prepare for the effects of a warming climate. It can be in many different ways, health, infrastructure, education, so on. Very similar to development, but that finance is lagging way behind. There was a commitment made in Glasgow to double adaptation finance by 2025 to around 40 billion. We're way off that. There's going to be more calls for that. A second key point of these talks is going to be the loss and damage piece. Now, this has been driven up the agenda massively this year. It's been described by Antonio Guterres as the litmus test of COP success, but it's also a really, really tricky subject. It's very politically contentious. Loss and damage finance, the the need for it is potentially endless. So if we just take, for example, Pakistan, just from those floods in the summer, the latest estimates for the damages there are about 30 billion per the World Bank. The Egyptian hosts have been really trying to put loss and damage on the agenda. Whether developing country nations will get the independent finance facility and independent finance streams that they want, along with a kind of a working governance mechanism, that remains to be seen. And just a flag finally for DevEx audience is the uh, Just Energy Transitions Partnerships. There has been one taking place in South Africa, moving that economy out of coal and into renewables and trying to do that in a way um, so the workers don't who staff those power plants don't all lose their jobs. If this deal kind of comes off as a success, there's talk of using it as a potential model for Indonesia, where the problems are different. They have newer power plants with a longer lifespan. India has also been asked by the G7 to engage in an energy transition scheme. But there's a lot of issues, very fiendish economic issues to nations which need to be fleshed out. So it will all remain to be seen over the course of these two weeks and beyond.
that's a lot to look out for and a lot that we'll definitely be covering for you. But one thing that I found really quite interesting about Glasgow is like how lively it was. It was like a lot of protests, a lot of like um, civil society groups taking part. But it looks like it might be different this year. What are you expecting um, from Egypt? And can you just paint a picture for us what Glasgow was like? Glasgow was, uh, there was a huge amount of, of, of activist activity, both within the venue, people with passes holding their own protests, and outside the venue, uh, the Extinction Rebellion, everyone will be very familiar with their work. They were holding very colourful, lively protests all day, every day, outside the venue, but of course not getting past those security gates. Egypt, as you alluded to, Rumbi, is... Of not a democracy, they have uh, much, much tighter um, restrictions on the freedom of assembly, the freedom to protest. There have already been media reports highlighting restrictions against residents, not just protesters, but residents of Sham El Sheikh in advance of this huge diplomatic event. So I think the protests are probably likely to be limited to the internal accredited type of protests because people who go to the COP accredited can register to do their own protest. The COP itself is on United Nations ground. It's UN territory. It's policed by the UN services themselves. Outside, I think it's going to be a very different story. I'd be extremely surprised if we saw any sort of dissent outside the COP grounds. An accredited protest. It seems like it takes away the whole point of protesting whatsoever but that will be quite interesting to watch and it's also quite interesting because there's been this push to have a lot more of these events in the global south so it'll be really quite interesting to see how Egypt handles this and it's sort of like a litmus test for other countries in the global south to see how they would actually incorporate other voices into the discussion. I hope we do see a bit of that in Sharm El Sheikh but we'll see as the week goes on. Hi, I'm Kate Warren, Executive Editor at DevEx. If you are listening to this podcast, you are likely working to achieve the Sustainable Development Goals. But are you subscribed to DevEx Newswire? Global development can be a fast-moving, complex sector. Our team of global reporters work every day to bring you the news you need to make sense of it all. In DevEx Newswire, we keep you up to date on issues ranging from climate change financing to gender equality and global health to transforming the food system all in a fun-to-read, free newsletter delivered directly to you five days a week. Join the hundreds of thousands of global development professionals who receive DevEx Newswire and visit devex.com slash newsletters to sign up to this free newsletter today. I just want to bring Sarah into this conversation because, um, Sarah, you've been um, reporting on the front lines of extreme weather conditions and how they're impacting communities. And we speak about and when we speak about loss and damage and we talk about the money, like you said, Will, it's mind boggling. But there are people who are actually affected by these disasters. So, Sarah, can you tell us a little bit about some of the communities that you've reported on, what their experience has been, how they've been affected by extreme weather and what are their hopes? What do they want to come out of um, such talks and negotiations? Yeah, thanks so much, Rumbi. Um, so I recently traveled to Somalia, uh, which is on the brink of famine. Uh, pastoralists have lost their livelihood and uh, their livestock and farmers have been unable to produce crops. Uh, people in response are flooding into urban centers in search of aid, but there's really limited resources in internal displacement camps. Um, I heard many stories of parents burying their children because of malnutrition and measles. Um, and I also saw the conditions people are living in. There is poor sanitation in these camps and people are really struggling to survive. Uh, so it's an incredibly urgent situation, and it has been for a long time. Um, so in Somalia, there used to be longer gaps in between when droughts would occur, but now the frequency and severity of extreme weather is on the rise. Um, so the ability of communities to cope is gone. 
Um, so instead of having that buffer between extreme droughts where they can work to recover and rebuild assets, they're now pummeled every year with crisis. Uh, so IDP, internal displacement camps in urban areas, are becoming permanent homes for people because they they can no longer they no longer have the means to to support themselves. Um, so these communities need access to financing so that they can adapt to climate change. Uh, that means restoration of the natural environment, including the regrowth of forests, uh, the building of water infrastructure, access of farmers uh, and pastoralists to markets to sell their goods, uh, climate smart agriculture. Um, these will help to prevent the massive humanitarian disasters from occurring over and over again. Um, also, the conversations this week about loss and damage, as Will described, are incredibly relevant to Somalia because these communities are paying, <coughs> are paying the most significant toll and need compensation for the ways in which this crisis has devastated them. I also uh, recently traveled to Palu, Indonesia, uh, which was devastated by a tsunami in 2018. So as the oceans warm, it's expected storms like this could become turbocharged. Uh, so I heard awful stories about people battered by the massive waves. Uh, they showed me the scars on their bodies where sharp objects cut them as they were whipped through cities. Uh, they spoke to me about losing loved ones. Um, this extreme weather really takes years to recover from. This is, I spoke to them four years later after the tsunami and they're still recovering. Um, but also the trauma actually never really leaves them completely. Um, and many are still living in temporary shelter. Um, and much of the narrative of their lives now is shaped by this one day of crisis and the aftermath that followed. Um, I also met with an organization working on building economic empowerment of impacted women, um, and they told me that the quality and quantity of crops that women grow has also been impacted by climate change. Um, irrigation systems were damaged during the storm and not restored, and they're also dealing with a lot of flash flooding. Um, so the climate crisis is also now hindering their ability to rebuild and move on with their lives. So witnessing uh, the impacts of this severe weather has made me interested in the conversations around adaptation, resilience building, loss and damage, the intersection of health and climate, and then the building of early warning systems. Uh, so those are some of the areas that I'll be keeping an eye on over the next two weeks. Um, as Will mentioned, there's major frustration for a lot of countries on the front lines of the crisis um, that less money has been devoted to adaptation than towards mitigation. Um, but Rumbi, uh, turning to you. so. As I witnessed in Somalia, uh, the climate crisis is having a huge impact on food systems. Can you talk a bit about this and what you expect uh, during the discussions this week? Yeah, definitely. So, um, like you said, the um, impact um, of the of climate change in the Horn of Africa really shows what the impact of climate of the climate crisis is on food systems. And uh, food people who are working in food security and nutrition have been saying this for a long time. And they've been uh, campaigning to make sure that the food systems as a whole is sort of incorporated in the COP agenda. That didn't happen last year in Glasgow. And there was a lot of disappointment and a lot of backlash about that. But it, it appears that this year that food system is actually featuring prominently on the agenda. For the first time ever, there's going to be a food systems pavilion at COP and that's going to be run by a coalition of international food organizations with a lot of people sort of showcasing solutions and innovations that they are working on, which is going to be quite interesting and definitely something that I can that I will be watching and following. And then also in terms of like um the discussions that will be happening um this year, what the people that I've spoken to are basically calling for and they have been calling for this for a long time. They're saying that we need a climate resilient, nutrition sensitive food systems approach, which is a mouthful. But basically what they are saying is that the impact of climate on food and nutrition is so great 
that countries that are affected, like Somalia, need access to finance to address, first of all, the impact to food system and also build resilience, as you alluded to, Sarah. So um, right now, they're really watching the discussions on finance. They're watching the discussions on um, a possible facility for loss and damage because in all these things, food systems are impacted and they should be at the forefront. And then on the flip side of the coin, when you also talk about mitigation, um, the estimate is that one third of global greenhouse emissions are actually uh, come from food and agriculture, from the food and agriculture sector. So it's really important that uh, people who work within food and agriculture are incorporated in these discussions um, because um, when it comes to mitigation, a lot needs to be done in that sector in particular. So when we're looking at national mitigation strategies and whatnot, we should always we should also be focusing on the agriculture sector to see how those um, emissions can be reduced as well. So these are some of the conversations that I'm going to be following. And um, obviously, everything sort of like hinges on finance. Everyone is asking for more finance. Everyone's asking for more money. And everyone's also asking for certain funds to be earmarked for something for food and security, per, as an example. So I'll be watching out for those conversations to see how the agreements actually pan out and how these discussions come to play. But I do have like a follow-up question for you, um, Will. Like I said, you were in Glasgow last year, but for Sarah and me, this will be our first COP. And um, this is really turning into a convening moment for people within the development community. What advice would you have to someone who's going to COP for the first time, a newbie? What advice would you give us? Comfy shoes is uh, my advice for people who are going. Um, yeah, it's, it's really interesting because a lot of um, NGO and development types that I met in, in, in Glasgow it actually was the, the first time they'd been there, the first time many major organisations had, had sent delegations, um, which is really interesting, partly because I imagine the proximity was, was easy for them from London, but also partly a recognition that climate is touching all of their work. So it's, it seems to me like that's increased this year and therefore it is, does seem like a great opportunity to, to make connections and make relationships, kind of break down those, I hate this word, but break down those silos that um, exist between development and climate and how, uh, you know, basically be able to learn from each other, from all the different expertise that converges um, on this conference, learn, make connections and, um, for many people to to organize and and can and, and and make plans for the future we will be going and looking at this cop i can tell you now the the people who have been following the cop for a long time who've been work the climate veterans as they were they will be thinking several cops down the line so climate's a space of really growing importance and develop and really needs to kind of get across that and this is a great chance for for them to do that and to think about how they're going to be making plans for that in the future making connections breaking down silos and comfy shoes that's sage advice from william worley and you heard it here first will sarah thank you so much for joining me i've thoroughly enjoyed speaking to you guys and getting to interview you guys which i don't do very often it seems like we've got a lot to look out for at COP27 and we'll all be on the ground giving you the latest updates. So please do look out for that as well as our coverage of accredited protests. Thank you for listening to COPcast. We'll be publishing episodes every day throughout COP27. So make sure to subscribe on your favorite podcast streaming platform. And if you enjoyed today's episode, please share it with others you think would be interested in it. You can also leave us a rating or a review on Apple Podcasts. If you have some feedback about this episode that you want to share or are at COP and want to let us know what we should be covering, we'd love to hear from you. You can find us on social media at devix and at rumbichakamba underscore, or you can drop us an email at podcast at devix.com. <laughs>